We're going to switch gears and look at another topic. I'm a strategy professor. One of the oldest and probably best advice in strategy, going back to the old SWOT framework, is build on your strengths. As you know, in business, it is really hard to create new strengths. If you've got strengths, the first thing to think about when you think about growth and success is your strengths. Clearly, one of the strengths of Europe is the Mittelstrand, of which Austria is really emblematic, and it's just a great opportunity being here to go in and look at that. To kick that off, um, I'm going to call up my co colleague, Javier Jimeno, um, to give a faculty lecture. Um, as Ilian said in the opening, for the last few years, INSEAD has been reinforcing our, our European roots by working on issues around European competitiveness. It's partly what allows us to animate a, a day like today. And Javier um, is the colleague who really stepped forward within the faculty to lead that deep expertise on competitive strategy. Um, so please join me in welcoming on the stage the Aon Dirk Verbeek, Chaired Professor in International Risk and Strategic Management, Javier Jimeno. Javier. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It's great to be here. Um, and I really like the, the, the theme of the, of the session, Europe, what works. So when one works on competitiveness in Europe, sometimes we tend to emphasize our weaknesses and the areas that we could do better. But let's also celebrate the areas in which we are strong. Uh, we started the uh, INSEA European Competitiveness Initiative around 2012-13. And at that point, there was a lot of debate within Europe about competitiveness. Uh, we thought that most of this debate was badly framed. It was framed in terms of, okay, how can we get lower labor costs so that we can become more competitive with the rest of the world? Or how can we devaluate our currency so that we can export? Uh, or how can we protect some of the strategic sectors so that we are not facing uh, a competition from outside? That is the wrong framing, and this is a, a something where I, I think most of the, or all of the faculty involved in the initiative would agree. The way we define competitiveness is in terms of productivity. Competitiveness is about companies based in a region being able to produce better services in, the more in a more effective way. And just to illustrate that important point, uh, there's a quote from, from Paul Krugman, Nobel Prize winner, saying, productivity isn't everything. But in the long run, it is almost everything. A country's ability to improve its standard of living over time depends almost entirely on its ability to raise its output per worker. So this is um, something that in business schools we tend to know about, productivity. Um, now, there has been a quiet revolution within this area of competitiveness about how we look at the topic. Uh, traditionally, the, the focus was at the macro level, so looking at country and what is the, the GDP per hour of work, looking at aggregate factors, macroeconomic factors, political issues. But more and more what we see is that clearly some countries, countries are not competitive in every industry, so the focus shifted to the industry level. So the idea of comparative advantage, so some countries might be better positioned so if you are in Spain, you can probably do tourism better than, than other places. Um, uh, also the idea of clusters. So the fact that companies locate together, and it is the co-location of them that allows them to, to, to have the competitiveness. And that's, for example, a very present the work of Porter, uh, some of the, 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 the strategies in places like Singapore and so on. But as more and more data is becoming available, there is a silent revolution in the way we look at this issue, which is, really at the firm and establishment level. Uh, places like the European Commission, the OECD, are collecting large databases of panel data at the firm, sometimes even at the plant level or establishment level, and trying to understand how productivity differs from company to company across countries, across industries, and over time. And there are some very surprising and interesting effects. So for example, if you control for country and industry. So you look at companies within the same country and the same industry. The difference in productivity, the amount of output per level of input that the company on the 90th percentile would have relative to the 10% is over twice as much. So there are even in industries that are considered commodities like cement, 
there are huge discrepancies in terms of the productivity, and part of this relates to the quality of the management, the strategy, things that business schools should know something about. These differences in productivity are also very sticky. So if you correlate these dimensions over time, the correlation is between 60 and 80 percent. So companies that are very productive tend to remain very productive and vice versa. So this is something that, that business schools should be able to know something about and, and talk about. Now, there has been a lot of research in different areas, in organizational economics, in strategy, in human resources management, and some of the, the recipes or the things that have been found to improve uh, the, the performance of organizations are the following. So first, uh, dimensions such as the long-term orientation of the management. So uh, there is a big debate about the, the role of founder owners, but the, there is research that suggests that companies run by founder owners tend to perform better because they have more of a long-term perspective. Long-term ownership, and that may be associated with blockholder ownership, uh, the, the perspective, the long-term perspective of investors, the, the, the source of financing also helps. Also, companies that have a view, a mission, to do something for stakeholders tend to be more long-term oriented and perform better. The second is about the strategy and innovation. And what you see is dimensions such as focus, not trying to do too many things, do few things really well, have a strong customer orientation, have a global orientation. That doesn't necessarily mean that you, as a company, need to be global, but you need to understand what are the best practices around the world and how to compete in a globalized market. And then innovation, which may come through, through technology, but also continuous innovation, just being able to do things better every day. And the third dimension, which is what we are going to focus more today, the management practices. And this really relates to some of the internal human resource practices inside these companies. Things like the incentives that are used, uh, the policies about uh, long-term employment, internal promotion, uh, individual or team objectives. Uh, the, the frequency and the way in which performance discussion and performance reviews are taking place. There are some companies in which, if you don't do well, nobody really tells you, nobody talks about it. Uh, second, and more and more, the success of the company depends on the talent. So companies that, are, uh, that focus on attracting talent, retaining talent, and training the talent, giving them the skill and career projection. And, and finally, the, the way they, they, they work in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the, the delegation and the empowerment of the people close to the action. So many of these companies have delegation of decision making at the local level, so they're closer to the ground which means that they also need to build a strong communication so that the person that is making the decision is able to have the information relevant for making that decision. So open management, data sharing, strong coordination, but also a lot of empowerment and, and delegation. Now, these characteristics that you see here are seen in medium-sized enterprises. I mean, for those of you familiar with the, 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 the concept of the hidden champion, a very common in, uh, in, in, by, by, by Professor um, Herman Simon, uh, it, these are some of the characteristics that, that come here. But it's not only about middle stand. I mean, you sometimes have divisions of large multinationals that have the same characteristics, high-performance organization. Now, in terms of the evidence, uh, typically the research here what they do, would do is create a laundry list of questions, maybe through surveys, maybe through interviews, and trying to ascend this type of practices. So I know that you cannot read this, but this, is, this would be the typical questionnaire that, that you would uh, do uh, to trying to learn about these this, uh, uh, performance uh, uh, practices, management practices. And the finding has been that the adoption of these management practices tend to improve not just operational productivity, but also the financial performance of these companies. Second, very important, companies that do well, do well not just by adapting one or the other, by adapting a bundle of this performance. So the idea of complementarity, you adopt the whole bundle that includes delegation, coordination, uh, uses of technologies, uh, communication style, and so on. And very important, although many of the famous cases of this type of organizations are in manufacturing, the evidence suggests that these practices work both for manufacturing and service firms. Although the evidence suggests that they were better for manufacturing than for service, and part of the reason is that the customer 
It's a little bit idiosyncratic, so sometimes they don't work, work well in these highly optimized uh, systems. So you would expect, looking at this, that every company should be applying some of these practices. I mean, there is not, uh, this is not rocket science, right? But there is a surprising level of difference of adoption of these practices around industries and around the world. A very impactful stream of research um, basically compared the level of sophistication of these practices across different countries. What you see is that in any country, in any industry, you will have a variance. There will be some companies more sophisticated than others. But what is interesting is the distribution, which is what you get when you get this lower level uh, data. So if you look at this is a, the, the data is organized from one, it will be the lowest worst practice to five. In most countries, you see a distribution. But what is interesting, if you look at the US, which is one of the, the, the most productive countries, what you see is that there are very few organizations at the lower end. Uh, if you look at places like Canada or Germany, the same. I mean, the distribution is cut on the left. But that is not necessarily the case in other places, which we consider as less competitive, places like maybe Greece, Italy, uh, Portugal, or, or even France. Now, the implication of this is interesting, right? Because it suggests that some of the average of productivity across these countries might be driven by the fact that the lower end of the tail is not somehow exiting and giving a space to more productive firms. Why would that be? It could be because of product market competition regulations, maybe barriers to entry. Maybe companies can stay alive without being highly competitive. Maybe differences in labor, uh, the labor market regulations, employee, um, uh, employee flexibility. Maybe differences in international exposure. So we see that in whichever country you are, subsidiaries of multinationals tend to be highly performing. And the reason is that they are exposed to best practices from other locations, which then allow them to adopt even if the average of the country is not that productive. So, so these are some of the, the lessons on, uh, um, that, that we get from the research. I want to share with you one case of one positive outlier. And, and this outlier, uh, I, I was able to study thanks to our host, uh, Cornelius. So when Professor Herman Simon came to INSEA to talk about hidden champions, I asked him, well, give me a, one company that you think is the most emblematic, the best example of this. And he said, rational AG. Uh, so we didn't have contacts inside, so uh, through Alexis, we asked Cornelius, and he had a contact, so we were able to, to interview the, the management of the company. So most of you do not know this company. This is why it's a hidden champion. Uh, they make high-end... Uh, kitchen equipments for restaurants, canteens, and so on. Basically, they have these two products. The, the one on the left is the Combi Steam. It combines steam and heat in a very targeted way, in every part inside, to allow to cook different pieces of food at perfection, you know, no matter what. So there is a lot of intelligence within the system. On the right, uh, there is the product that essentially substitutes the fryer. It's, a, it's called the Vario Cooking Center, and it's made by a subsidiary Freeman that they have in France. Now, the, story of, the history of this company is, uh, is quite interesting. So it started by a, by a founder entrepreneur, uh, Siegfried Meister. So he founded the company in 1973 and with the idea, the technology of this combi steamer. Very interesting, in 1982, at that point, they had the combi steamer on the portfolio board. They were also selling traditional ovens. Traditional ovens were over 60% of the revenues of the company. And he said, from now on, we are going to stop selling traditional ovens. So this is a great example of the long-term orientation. He understood the customers. He understood that this product served the customer's needs better than the alternative and focused for that. Um, may I have the slides, please? This one? Okay. Yeah. So, um, the, se the second interesting dimension is the, 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 the management. So after Mr. Mester, uh, Gunter Blaschke became the CEO. He was CEO for 15 years. He basically saw the company through IPO, and they just had a new CEO in 2014. Now, let me, let me quickly walk through some of the things that make Rational a very interesting company. First, in terms of the strategy, is the, uh, they apply many of the practices that we discussed earlier. They are very focused on customer needs. They work with chefs to understand their needs well. 
not just in terms of the quality of the food that they produce, which would allow you to charge a premium for the quality, but also for the efficiency. It saves you money using their machines. So you see their products in five-star restaurants, but also in uh, canteens, uh, I think in the Munich, uh, uh, in the, the, the Munich Stadium, and then in Seat restaurant. So clearly, also focus on efficiency. High quality and efficiency. Very focused product line, and then strong uh, innovation, so they keep investing on the innovation, which gives them a six to seven year lead in terms of the futures relative to the main competitors. Um, and then a very strong supply chain and operational focus. Now, in, in terms of the management practices, and this is the, the most interesting part, very strong delegation. So when I visited the company, uh, the, the, the management emphasized, well, here we are all entrepreneurs. They have the UEU, Undernehmer im Undernehmen. So entrepre entrepreneur within the enterprise. And everybody has a supplier, a process, and a client, internal and external. One of the things that amazed me is that each machine is assembled by one employee from beginning to end. The employee puts the name on it. So the ownership that that creates of the product is incredible. Second, uh, a strong internal training. So many of the employees have been there for a long time. They have a high commitment of the company, and they are able to move up throughout the company. And then in terms of the, 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 the communication and the performance orientation, uh, this is a typical uh, 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 process improvement culture, so there is a lot of data sharing, so if you walk around the, the, the plant, there are information about the, the, the performance of different processes, and strong incentives, interestingly, mainly at the team level. So if a team develops an innovation or outperforms the target, it is the whole team that gets a benefit to be shared as a team. So that, again, reinforced the culture of a strong team performance. Now, in terms of the, the performance, uh, again, uh, fantastic. So they have 54 market, global market share in their category. I've never seen many companies like this. Uh, just a few statistics. So they are fairly small, so half, half a billion dollars. But as you can see, uh, 145 million on EBIT. The return on invested capital has been pretty much stable over the last 10 years, averaging around 35% year on year. Uh, they have been able to grow so about twice uh, over the last 10 years in, in both in sales and EBIT, and about four times in terms of the market value. So uh, this has been recognized by, by many different institutions, and as you can see, they have received many awards for their innovation, the, 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 the way they manage operations, and so on. So this is just one example of a company that, for me, is probably the best company that I have ever seen. And as part of INSEAD, you have opportunities to see many companies in the way everything is aligned uh, to produce at a high level of performance in a particular niche. Which I think brings us back to the theme of our topic, which is Europe, what works? I think the, the opportunity that we want to discuss here is the opportunity for medium-sized companies. And this is what works and what could work even better. In 2013, we ran an, an, uh, a survey of alumni, and we asked them, in the middle of the, the European crisis, lack of confidence about the future, what type, of, what type of companies do you expect will bring the highest improvement of productivity in Europe for the next 10 years? And as you can see, by far the number one of those, ahead of multinationals, ahead of startups, was European medium-sized enterprises. And this is an area where Europe has strong advantages. Now, it's a strategy that also comes with risks. I mean, the risk of being focused also means that if there is a radical change in the industry, you could lose out. Uh, the, the risk of becoming complacent, become too attached to the status quo. But if you focus and you manage that the company well, as this company does, this is a great recipe for sustained performance. Thank you very much. I hope that this is a good introduction for the CEO panel that we will have now. Thank you. Thank you.